Excellencies, uh, most reverend fathers, dear friends, a wise man uh, said me that it's important starting a speech with some joke. So, <laughs> and uh, I would say a joke that is not a joke. Uh, when I was a young, when I was a youngster, a student, only very optimistic men studied English. Very pessimistic men studied Chinese. And a realistic men studied Russian. So I studied Russian. So for this reason, I ask uh, your pardon for my English, especially to the really English-speaking people. <laughs> Uh, because English is a beautiful language, it's possible to speak English in many languages. Uh, I will speak in Slovak language, uh, in Slovak English, so more or less. Uh, thank you for this uh, presentation, and nevertheless, I uh, will try to read some part of my quite long uh, presentation. But uh, the topic is uh, diaspora, from the point of view of the Congregation for the Eastern Churches. is uh, some kind of... Uh, hereditary uh, illness that I'm still thinking uh, from the point of view of the Congregation for the Oriental Churches, that is uh, my uh, 10 years uh, job that at this congregation maybe influenced me to, to be ready to consider the things also from the point of view of the congregation, not only from the point of view of the Oriental Catholics, that sometimes these two point of views, not any time uh, is uh, in uh, uh, accordance. So, Congregation for the Oriental Churches deals with the matters concerning the Eastern Churches, both about persons and about things. Members, by right, are, are the patriarchs and major archbishops of the Eastern Churches, as well as the president of the Council for the Christian Unity. Consultors and officials are to be chosen in such a way as to take into account, as far as possible, the diversity of rights. Now, before Addressing directly the main topic of our conference, that is the relationship of the congregation with the faithful in so-called diaspora, I want to briefly present some specific and most important fields of relationship between the congregation and the Eastern Catholic Churches in general, that is both in traditional territory, whether they are located outside the traditional Eastern territories. Above all, the events of recent decades allow us to identify the most varied types of institutional relations that reflect the new ecclesial and geopolitical situation created following the collapse of the totalitarian regimes of the former Soviet bloc, the Warns, the Sheikh, the countries of the Middle East, and by the subsequent migratory wave of the Orientals. The precise purpose of this intervention is not so much to make a detailed list of concrete interventions in relation to the individual churches. Instead, we want to identify the types of interventions in order to better evaluate their ecclesiastical significance and to be able to foresee, starting from them, also the future developments of this relationship. So I divide in my paper in different uh, chapters, starting with the overlook at the beginnings of the organization of the diaspora of Eastern Catholic in North America. So the commitment of the congregation in the organization of the structure and order of the churches and the birth of administrative district in diaspora. It seems useful to retrace at least briefly some steps in the history of this phenomenon of diaspora of Orientals, which, has, which had its, its beginnings at the end of the 19th century in America. The development of the ecclesiological and canonical attitude towards the communities of Eastern migrants in America illustrates the complexity of the process through which the issue of the Eastern Diaspora in the Catholic Church was addressed. At the beginning, I'm summarizing, of the 20th century among the Ameri American hierarchy, the presence in the United States of a new group of Catholic immigrants had aroused alarm. The bearer of an ecclesial tradition different from the Latin one in its disciplinary and liturgical manifestations. 
The celibacy of the local clergy was only one aspect of diversity, although it was the most evident. Deep were the perplexities and differences of opinion regarding the regime of hierarchical dependence of the so-called Rutenian priest, Rutenian is common name for different Slavic branches of Slavic people. Uh, this priest, mostly married, who came from Europe for religious assistance to their compatriots, it was not known, in fact, whether the territorial criterion should be considered prevalent or the ritual one. In this climate of uncertainty, the Congregation of Propaganda Fide for Eastern Rite Affairs, the predecessor of the current Congregation for the Oriental Churches, in harmony with the American Episcopate, took a stand in favor of the canonical principle of territoriality, by virtue of which the Latin ordinaries had jurisdiction over all Catholics, including Easterners, residing in their respective territories. However, at least in the very early stages of the affair, the dicastery interventions did not take the form of legislative acts or provisions of general significance, but was limited to instruction and directiveness, directives given from time to time that personam to individual American bishops. A legitimate plurality of territorially overlapping ecclesiastical circumscriptions was the normal state in which Catholic bishops, both Latin and of other right, usually operated in the East. But outside the traditional territory, the hierarchs of the Eastern right could not exercise their jurisdiction. However, with equal determination, the opposition of the Holy See to any hypothesis of Latinization of the Ruthenian faithful in North America remained firm since the intent of Propaganda Fide was to protect the existence of an Eastern and Catholic tradition, not only in the East, but also in the Latin territories, guaranteeing the Oriental faithful to right to free exercise of their own right and imposing the prohibition to pass to the Latin one. So very simply saying, in America, the local Latin bishop consider all Christians, all Catholics, to subject to proper jurisdiction, and uh, they express their wish that anybody come to America should be a Latin, because this is my territory. Oh, it was discovered by Cristoforo Colombo, but okay. anyway, it's my territory. The propaganda fide said no, anybody have the right to preserve the proper liturgical right, but about jurisdiction we are not so sure. Uh, Certainly we don't allow here to have the married priest because that should be a scandal for the celibatary Latin priest. So it's better to keep the Orientals under our jurisdiction without permitting them to have the proper jurisdiction. This was the mentality of first decades of migration. The prescription of celibacy as a condition for being in communion with the local Latin ordinary Placed priests who have already been present and active in the United States for some time in the very difficult situation of having to decide whether to obey to ecclesiastical authority by renouncing the care of souls or continue to exercise the sacred ministry among the all faithful or finally join the Orthodox Church. We know, the scholars know the result that practically half of Eastern Catholic and half of clergy passed to the Orthodox Church and some new Orthodox churches was born for this intransigency the, of the Latin hierarchs to have only celibatary priests in the United States. And this situation practically started with 1890 and was valid un until 2015, 14, 15. So for 120 years, more or less, we keep this legislation that prohibited the two Orientals have a married clergy, the thing that is completely normal in the traditional territories. After 2015, the legislation was changed, and the world is still staying. Nothing happens. 
So that is confirmation that this presumption was based more so, uh, uh, more uh, on the some prejudice that in real fear for looking at the Latin priest that will be also uh, decide to leave the uh, celibatary states. It seems that uh, als also without the oriental married clergy, the crisis of celibacy in the Western world was present and not conditioned about presence or not of the oriental married priests. So uh, finally, the Holy See step by step decide to allow the oriental jurisdiction in the United States and in Canada. In Canada, the situation was quite easier because it was not the idea of melting pot like in America, but the um, coexistence of different culture and also different uh, exp uh, religious expression. And finally, the Holy See accepted the idea that in the United States, as well in Canada, should be possible or can be possible to have the episcopal jurisdiction in the same territory, Latin and Eastern. So details, historical and technical, they are not so important. The second part of relationship between migration and diaspora and Oriental Christians start after the Second World War, when seven million of Ruthenians, Ukrainians and Belarusians were practically eradicated from their houses in consequence of war, and many of them perished in concentration camps. Of the others, a considerable number returned volunta voluntarily or under pressure to their countries of origin, but some about 300,000 people, including seminarians, hundreds of priests, hundreds of priests and thousands of lay people, in the immediate post-war period were in various camps in Central and Western Europe and refused to return to their Soviet homeland where a ferocious persecution of the totalitarian regime against the Catholic Church. And many Ruthenian and Ukrainian refugees who took refuge mainly in Austria, France and West Germany chose to emigrate to Canada and the United States, but also many of them still remain in Western Europe. So the second wave of administrative organization of the Orientals in Europe, started in Europe, not in the United States or in America, but in Europe with the uh, organization of different exarchates or uh, other structures, especially for the Ukrainian church. The third wave, wave or third expression of diaspora is that diaspora that is uh, consequence of geopolitical crisis in the Middle East and the migratory situation. As for the other Eastern churches, which show a strong migration of the faithful, especially in, the, in recent decades, the balance of peace and coexistence seriously compromised in the Near and the Middle East feed the diaspora, making it an incessant phenomenon even in our days. The civil war in Lebanon, 1975-1990, the Gulf Wars, the first and the second starting from 2003, and the continuing Palestinian question have significantly reduced the presence of Christian communities due to the massive migration. <laughs> in more conspicuous Eastern communities of emigrants, in some cases, outnumber those of the motherland. And this is experienced the problems of welcome and intercultural and interritual integration that has strong ecumenical and interreligious resonance on a daily basis. The fourth kind of intervention of the Holy See and the Congregation for the Eastern Churches uh, was uh, intervention after the fall of the communism in 1990 uh, in Central and Eastern Europe and the reorganization of the local churches in Ukraine, in Romania, in Slovakia and so. So practically now we have the two kinds of diaspora. Diaspora not hierarchically organized and diaspora that have some organization. 
In recent decades, the countries of Western Europe have been increasingly involved in migratory phenomena of people in search of a better future. Many people mi uh, migrate with the hope of living in a more, more dignified way. There are those who come in search of a job and a house to stabilize themselves, while others come only for a temporary period that would allow them to improve their economic situation in their country of origin. After the collapse of the Iron Curtain, immigration from Eastern Europe to the West took place mainly from the poorest countries, such as those of the former Soviet Union and those of Balkan region. The result of this new awareness and the search for the best way to deal with a migratory phenomenon, both ancient and even new, is the current instruction Erga Migrantes Caritas Christi of the Pontifical Council for the Pastoral Care of Migrants and the Itinerants, approved by the Supreme Pontiff John Paul II on May 1, 2004. As the instruction recalls, in human mobility there are now also very numerous faithful of the Eastern Catholic Churches from Asia and the Middle East, from Central and Eastern Europe, who are heading to the countries of the West. This fact clearly presents us with the problem of their pastoral care. The situation places before the whole church and before the congregation for the Oriental churches in particular an exquisitely pastoral requirement that is the duty to promote faithful pastoral action and at the same time open to new developments also with regard to our own pastoral structures. And we can quote, especially the canon of, code of canon of the Eastern churches, canon 192 and 193. The code, as we see, recommends the promotion and observance of the rights of the Eastern churches as patrimony of the universal church of Christ and establish a precise norm concerning liturgical and disciplinary laws. It obliges the bishop to also assist Christian faithful of any age, condition, nation, or church to Uris, whether they live in the territory of his diocese or stay there temporarily, and to see to it that the Christian faithful and of another church to Uris entrusted to him preserve the right of their own church, possibly thanks to priests and parish priests of the same church to Uris. As regards the constitution of the parishes, the court recommends that the parish be territorial without excluding personal ones if required by particular conditions. So I don't will quote all the norms of the Erga Migrantes Caritas Christi. Very simply, we can say that in the territories where only Latin jurisdiction exists, the duty of local territorial Latin bishop is to help or different migrants to insert themselves in the local pastoral structures if they are Latin migrants. For the Oriental migrants, technically and formally speaking, the duty of Latin bishops is to help the Orientals to gather together to give him them the proper priest, pri priest of proper church, and finally to help them to go out of his jurisdiction, creating a proper parishes, exarchates, or eparchies. This is some paradoxical paradox because the principal duty of the local Latin bishop is to help the Orientals to be free from his uh, care. But technically it's so. The question is <laughs> more complicated when we consider that in some territory can exist more than one territorial bishop. Even in the mentality, in the common mentality, the territorial bishop is Latin bishop and the other bishop they are personal bishops or personal parishes. But in the, in the case like this one, Holy See should uh, select one of the local bishops to entrust it to his care, the pastoral care for the oriental migrants. And practically we 
slowly, 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 we, uh, we, we have just arrived at this consideration. For example, yesterday I visited the Slovak community of Greek Catholics, our churches, that was formally entrusted not to the local Latin bishop, but to the Ukrainian bishop that is closer from linguistical and liturgical point of view. Until some years ago, that would be impossible to consider that somebody other than Latin bishop could be entrusted to care, take care of oriental migrants, of oriental diaspora. So I think that we can, we can stop. You can read the paper that is quite uh, technical and uh, uh, maybe the last words that I can say is about the hierarchically organized diaspora. In relation to the bishops established outside the Eastern Territory, the Apostolic See exercised some of the competences provided by the Code. For example, according to the Canon 139, the approval of the Apostolic See is envisaged when a bishop not belonging to any province chosen a metropolitan who will exercise the rights of a metropolitan of the province in his regard. It was a question. With regard to the metropolitan constituted outside the Eastern Territory, the Apostolic See, in accordance with the Canon 138, can issue special norms regarding his rights and duties, or he can approve such special norms proposed by the Synod of the Bishops of the Patriarchal Churches. So phenomenon of the diaspora in the recent history of the Oriental Catholic Churches has had various forms and has been the occasion for the elaboration of various types of approach towards the ecclesial life of the Orientals established outside their traditional territories. The Apostolic See, represented by the Congregation for the Eastern Churches, has tried to react to the situation created over the decades with various interventions and through different juridical institutes. The idea of the submission of the Orientals to the local Latin hierarchy, as it was tried, tried to do at the beginning of the 20th century in America, proved harmful to the life of the Church and of the Eastern Catholics. And therefore, in the following decades, there was the progressive creation of structures and circumscriptions proper to the Eastern Churches. The relationship of those circumscriptions with the Latin Church and with their own Church Suiuris required the elaboration of precise juridical, juridical norms and at the same time open to the possibility of re reacting flexibly to concrete situation. Where for the moment it had not been possible to erect a proper hierarchy for Eastern Catholics, canon law has developed the tools also expressed in the recent instruction Erga Migrantes Caritas Christi, which guarantee the development of the identity of Eastern Catholics, the preservation of the ritual, liturgical, and disciplinary identity. In fact, the activity of the congregation extends to all affairs which are proper to the Eastern churches and which must, must be referred to the Apostolic See, both regarding the structure and organization of the churches and regarding the exercise of the function of teaching to sanctify and govern both about people, their status, their rights and duties. The congregation also follows the communities of Eastern faithful who are in the territorial circumscriptions of the Latin Church with attentive diligence and provides for their spiritual needs by means of visitors, indeed where the number of faithful and circumstances require it, possibly also by means of our own hierarchy, after having consulted the competent congregation for the constitution of the particular churches in the same territory. Apostolic and missionary action in the regions where Eastern rites have prevailed since ancient times depends exclusively on this congregation, even if it's carried out by missionaries of the Latin Church. So the congregation must proceed in mutual agreement with the Council of, for the Union of Christians in matters that may concern relations with the non-Catholic Eastern Churches and also with the Council for Inter-Religious Dialogue in the matters 
falling within its scope. Thank you for your passion and 